Good morning. Good morning. Morning. All right. Uh, Kartik, are you all ready to go? Yep, all ready. Cool. I think that uh, we'll probably start at about 8.03. Um, do you want to try sharing your screen off just to get that going? Yeah, give me one second. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, got it. Okay, are you, are you guys able to see it? Yep, I can see it. All right, is that good? Yep, thank you. All right, perfect, thank you. So I'll just leave it like that, is that good? Or do you want me to share That's it a little later, unshare? That's fine, you can just leave it as is for now. Perfect, thanks. Yep. Hey, Clint. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everybody. We'll give it just a couple minutes to, to get going to get some more folks to join. All right, just one more minute, we'll get kicked off. All right, let's see, we don't have uh, the normal load of people, but I think we should still get going anyways here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, we've got a schedule within the, uh, the Google Drive as usual. Uh, it's packed with a couple things. Uh, we're going to have a, a presentation from, from Yugabyte. Uh, so Kartik's on the line here to, to talk about uh, the scale up database that they've been creating. I think it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then we'll also have uh, a, a spot to talk about the, the sessions at, at KubeCon, a little follow-up discussion. Before getting into that, I just wanted a general note. Uh, I think that Camille has been reaching out to some folks on the SWG. 
Um, please do uh, spend some time with Camille to give her some feedback on, on the SWG and, and what it's doing and what it should do or what you think it should do. Uh, this is all part of you know, making sure that, that as a TOC makes decisions on you know, or, or giving charters to the, to the storage working groups that they're informed of you know, based on the perspectives of the people in the groups. So if you could take some time and give Camille some feedback if she's reached out to you, I think that we'd all appreciate that. Uh, so with that, let me hand it over to Kartik and we'll get going talking about Yugabyte. All right, thanks a lot. Hey guys, I'm Kartik. Uh, going to like uh, uh, going to talk to you about uh, Yugabyte. It's a transactional, high performance database for planet scale applications, and we'll dive right into what that is in detail. Uh, a real quick intro about ourselves, like uh, three of us, uh, the founders started this, like it's uh, Kannan, Karthik and myself, we started the project. Uh, I'm one of the, uh, the founders and the CTO here and uh, all three of us, including nine others, worked at, at Facebook on a variety of different applications in production. We worked on both Cassandra and HBase uh, in order to uh, put it in production for use cases such as our in messaging uh, inbox, messaging search, time series, spam detection, so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, let's jump right in. So real quick thing about the problem we're trying to solve. We saw this pattern repeated quite often at Facebook and, and having been in the open source community with HBase way back, we had seen that a lot of companies were trying to repeat this at the, the web 2.0 uh, like tech company sector. But now this pattern is becoming even more common in the enterprise, especially with the advent of the public cloud. So how do people build planet scale apps? It's like pretty clear that Docker with Kubernetes as the orchestration is the favorite choice for people to put stateless applications in. And that's pretty much going into production and becoming mainstream. But when it comes to data, that's when the challenge begins. So today's way of doing a data architecture is to have a SQL master and slave, whether it's sharded or a single node scale up solution, they have a SQL master and slave. And they have one or more NoSQL solutions because there are certain advantages provided by NoSQL databases that really help. And the minute you put your data across multiple data stores, it becomes very expensive to recompose the data. So people put the data that they need to serve to the end user into a cache, like Redis. So immediately with this sort of an architectural setup, like even if it is containerized, the issue then becomes you need to figure out which subset of the data goes into a transactional database like, like an SQL database, which subsets and what types of access patterns are ideal for which of the NoSQL databases, and which of the subset of data is being accessed by the user and therefore has to stay in a cache like Redis. And because multi-region is becoming like the norm, uh, and a lot of applications want to keep their data closer to the user for low read latency access, you need to figure out how to replicate it at pretty much every level, right? And if there is a failure in this sort of a, a system that's put together and uh, it's like the blueprint is similar, but the exact implementation varies, maybe the choice of technology varies a little bit here and there, but in, inevitably if there's a failure, it takes a long time to figure out what went wrong, right? So at Yugabyte, so the question we get asked is like, suppose you go to a public cloud like AWS, right? Let's take the AWS example. How does it change this picture? Well, it, it makes it a little easier for sure, but not a whole lot because you replace the Redis set of machines with Elasticash that Amazon or a cloud provider will manage for you. The SQL is replaced with something like an Aurora or an RDS, and the NoSQL tier is replaced with DynamoDB. So, so effectively, the architecture is still pretty much predominantly the same. So at Yugabyte, we tried to go into why is it not possible to converge all the three, and this is based on a lot of work we did at Facebook and with a lot of other work we had done, we had seen done at sister teams with the projects like Tau. So what really is the characteristic of the databases that makes it like makes an app require multiple of them, right? So if we split it into three core requirements, like pillars that a database should offer, you can think of it as SQL databases, including Aurora, offer you high performance and transactionality, but not planet scale because it's difficult to get your data distributed and scaled out, add machines as you want, like all of those are manual. Uh, NoSQL databases like MongoDB on the open source side or a variety of others, and like that's just an example, and uh, Azure Cosmos DB, which is a multi-model NoSQL database through Microsoft, um, 
both offer high performance and planet scale, but don't offer transactions when you need them. Like I'm talking about transactions in, the, in both a single row and multi-row. So some of that is offered, some of that is not. Um, on the other side, like the other tack that Google Spanner took was to go after planet scale and transactional workloads, but it's not ideal for high performance because you're subject to uh, atomic clock, like uh, effectively the atomic clock latency for streaming type of workloads where you don't really need it. And so at Yugabyte, we're trying to bring all the three pieces together. So it's got to be high performance where you can serve it with low latency. Um, and it can just be a serving tier. It's got to be transactional when you need it for the subset of applications that are subset of workloads that need transactions and planet scale. Okay, so those are our design goals. Transactional, high performance, planet scale, and of course, cloud native. So really quickly, on the transactional side, we wanted to have, we wanted the core data fabric to have distributed asset transaction support for both single row and multi-row asset, and with a document-based storage engine core, but that can be exposed using a variety of different APIs that people are used to. On the performance side, we wanted it to be really low latency, so ideally for a majority of the workloads, people should not need to deploy a cache in front of this system, and it should be able to accommodate high throughput. Build it with planet scale in mind, so you're able to globally distribute data, as well as offer tunable reads so that people in remote data centers can read from their nearest data center with some semblance of consistency. And finally, on the cloud native side, the obvious ones are of course being highly scalable and highly resilient. So add nodes when you need to either expand your storage footprint or you need more serving capacity or cache capacity and be highly resilient, which is tolerate node failures or most of the common cloud failures without any intervention. But more importantly, also make it really easy for the uh, user to use this database by expressing an intent and the database kind of respecting the user's intent and also give a seamless operator experience for day two operations when you're trying to keep this running in production. And we're gonna look at a few of these things in detail, but at the core of the database, like what we did was instead of being too purist about the exact languages, we brought in the features, the best features on the two sides of the house. So this, on the SQL side, we bring in strong consistency, secondary indexes, asset transactions, single row, multi-row, and the expressiveness of the query language where you have where clause and joins is something we'll continually work towards and add, so that's at the core philosophy. And on the NoSQL side, we bring in tunable read, read uh, latency, so read from my uh, a follower or one of my async replicas of the nearest data center if you want low read latency but you're okay with timeline consistency. Optimize for large streaming writes. Support features like automatic expiry of data with a time to live kind of feature and be able to scale out and uh, be fault tolerant with your data, with uh, primitives to support how do you partition data, how do you lay out data on disk, so on and so forth. Okay, so if you take Azure Cosmos DB as the bleeding edge of NoSQL and Google Spanner as the bleeding edge of SQL in a cloud-like environment today, uh, what Yugabyte is, it brings the best of the two worlds into a single database. So we are multi-model and high performance just like uh, Azure Cosmos DB. and uh, asset transactional and globally consistent like Spanner. Okay, so uh, very briefly on the architecture. Um, at the core, it's a scale out database. You'll be able to add machines in order to scale it out. Uh, each node has a, what is called a doc DB is what we call it internally. It's a heavily customized version of rocks DB. And uh, the nodes, in order to replicate data with consistency across nodes, we use raft based replication. We have a global transaction manager in order to do distributed transactions or distinguish it from a single row asset and still keep that highly performant. And uh, we do automatic sharding and load balancing across all the data, irrespective of how you access it. And all of this is written in, in pure C++, so everything is, is ground up, put together in C++ for high performance. Um, and finally, we allow people to access the database through well-known languages as starting points. So we offer Cassandra CQL, uh, like Cassandra query language, the Redis API, and, a, and we're working on Postgres as another API. So you'll be able to come in through any of these three APIs. Each of them forms a table in the core data fabric and is able to service. And some of these languages, we have actually added extensions as we see fit, like in order to support the use cases we want. For example, in Cassandra, 
we added distributed transactions, so you'll be able to do begin transactions, do some stuff, end transactions, with secondary indexes, JSON data support, and so on and so forth. So with that as what Yugabyte is, it's, it does not have external dependencies, so it can run on-premise, on a cloud, on a, a VM, on a container. It can pretty much run anywhere, so on any IaaS. All right, so, so just a brief intro. Um, now, let me go into what the current state of Yugabyte is, and then we can jump into like a demo that like of a shopping cart. Uh, on the current state side, we're in 0 0.97 uh, publicly available beta, marching towards a 1.0 generally available version in March, in April timeframe. Uh, but we've tested it so far for high scalability. So we've gone up to 50 nodes and we're able to see that you can linearly scale and get uh, millions of reads and write IOPS without really sacrificing your latency. So um, like what, what you see at 50 nodes is, and these are key value, like point key value reads. So 2.6 million reads with 200 microsecond latencies and 1.2 million writes with three millisecond, but that's a three-way replicated consistent write. Okay, and it's a highly performant database because that's another of our core pillars. So we tested it against some of the more performant NoSQL databases like Cassandra. Uh, this is a YCSB report of what Yugabyte compares with Cassandra. Uh, and uh, it shows the number of operations per second. So we've taken a lot of, uh, we put in a lot of effort and a lot of learnings from running such systems in production at Facebook in order to squeeze a lot of performance out of it, but performance is a continuum. It's, a, it's never ending, so we'll continue to keep improving it. Uh, we added distributed transactions, so you'll be able to create a table, a Cassandra table, and in this classical banking bank, bank account example, you have an account name, account type balance. You can shard your data by account name, Having sharded all of the account names and keeping them together, you'll be able to perform uh, cross shard transactions where one account, you're able to transfer uh, some money from one account to another account, which could potentially live on different nodes. And we uh, do the whole clock tracking, clock skew, et cetera. Uh, this is uh, an actual running uh, system in one of our customers' uh, like environments. Uh, it's like uh, an example of a user login password style uh, setup two copies of the data in US West, two copies in US East, and one copy in Tokyo. Uh, the replication factor is five, which means you need a quorum of three guys in order to do the, the write successfully with consistency. And your reads can happen from any of the data centers that are, that are local to you. This setup can actually survive an entire region failure but and give you low read latency from any of the different regions. So users logging in would be able to log in very quickly. Uh, but users changing their password would have like, uh, like the, so the read latencies are in the 200 microsecond range, whereas the write latencies are close to 200 milliseconds, even if the, and this is an average across load testers running up in on all the three different uh, geographic regions. And that's because you have to get quorum to establish consistency and writes from Tokyo would invariably take longer to do that. Uh, we, like Yugabyte already works with multiple clouds, so Amazon, Google, and on-premise are well-tested, and uh, Azure is something that we are trying to add support for. But let's jump quickly into our demo, and this is an all-Kubernetes demo. Um, Yuga Store is a sample app that's an online e-commerce uh, bookstore. You can find it on GitHub, it's, it's, so it's an open source project as well. Uh, so. The first thing that I've done, and because this is not too terribly interesting to do live and wait for it to come up, is to bring up Yugabyte as a uh, Kubernetes stateful set. It's a replication factor three setup. So the Yugabyte cluster is three-way replicated, and it's got three nodes in it, and this can be scaled up or down on the fly. The second thing that I did was to bring up the, um, the Yuga Store app. This is a Node.js, Express, and React-based app which simulates a bookstore. Uh, so it's like a very simple e-commerce app. It lists some books. You'll be able to categorize books into some static groups and so on. So having done that, let me quickly jump into showing you the actual application. Uh, hopefully you guys are able to see the screen. It's, uh, it's the Kubernetes dashboard. Um, and please do say something if you're not. Otherwise, I'm assuming it's all good. Um, so what you see here, the first, um, the, these three P servers are the slaves. These are the guys that actually serve IO. The three masters are background coordinators. There are as many masters as, there is the, as the replication factor. And the last 
deployment here is the stateless app deployment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch into the Yugabyte dashboard. So this is actually running inside Kubernetes, and you see that the different masters uh, have talked to each other and using Raft elected one of themselves as the leader. Um, and this setup has replication factor three. It has one key space with one table in it called products. And we're going to look at a demo of how that shows up in the UI. Um, it's got three T servers, and obviously that is scalable on the fly. So if I go to the, oops, one second. Yeah, it's one second. I think my. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, take me a second here. Sorry. Something's got to go wrong when you do a demo, right? So. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Uh... Did you uh, sacrifice anything to the demo gods this morning, Kartik? Uh, what's that? I Did forgot you... to start the uh, mini cube. So, like, because that thing hums and you guys wouldn't be able to hear me, but uh, it's all good now. Um, okay, so we're back in business, sorry. <laughs> like, that thing really makes a noise on my machine, so. Um, yeah, so these are the, the tablet servers. Uh, what you see about this setup is it's all running in a single cloud, single region, single zone. So it's not a multi, but it can very easily be deployed in a multi-region, multi-zone, or a multi-cloud fashion. Uh, the, the, the database internally understands that. Uh, now let's go to the, the React app. So this is the app that shows you a list of uh, products or books that are being listed. Uh, there are some static categories. So you can look at books just which are the business books, um, cookbooks, mystery and suspense books, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and these are more static groupings. You'll be able to go into any one of these uh, books and be able to see some static content like the title and the description and some dynamic content like the average uh, rating, like the number of stars that people have given on average and the total number of reviews and, and so on and so forth. And uh, you'll be able to sort by the dynamic uh, attributes as well, which is you'll be able to see like what are your the books sorted by the total number of stars that you got, total number of reviews you have, so on and so forth, right? So, so that's the app. Um, and uh, I'm still working on adding like the checkout and the shopping cart and that side of things which require like distributed transactions. But jumping back to our presentation, so how does Yugabyte simplify this, right? Like typically for the less static content, like the less dynamic content, like the title and the description, uh, SQL-like API, like for example, Cassandra is a, is a great choice to store the data because you'll be able to see most of the attributes you want and you'll be able to add the ever-growing attributes to like a JSON data type. Whereas for the highly dynamic content that changes all the time, Redis is a great example of figuring out the things you want to store, like for example, the average rating or the total number of reviews, right? So in Yugabyte, you'll be able to model your products as a table and run a query such as the one shown, and we will try this live, uh, to be able to select some uh, books from the business category. And on, at the bottom, you'll be able to use Redis sorted sets in, and with the actual reviews as the score to figure out that most reviewed books or the number of stars as the score to figure out the most rated books. Now, let's actually do that, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna to connect to this, uh, to T-Server Zero and using a Cassandra shell, and we can actually do a select and figure out the top two books in the business category, which it's able to fetch. And, that, and you can like go ahead and add any number of categories and, and, and uh, you can alter the table online, upgrade the uh, like software online, so on and so forth. You can actually reconfigure the database to run on a different set of nodes or regions without taking an application downtime. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, connect to Redis. And so if you wanted the top 10 books by the number of reviews, you can go ahead and run that. And that's a Redis sorted set. All of this data is being stored as a persistent store inside Yugabyte. So you don't need to supplement Redis with the data being present in another database. 
So all of this is just a single database dealing with everything. And finally, let's run the equivalent uh, a robot user, like like your like the Bangladeshi click farm if you use a cliched example. So if you so it's just like viewing products one after the other. And we'll be able to go into our UI here and we'll be able to refresh and we should start seeing some load getting pumped into the into the various uh, machines. And, and the point here is that you can add nodes on the fly and the load would get evenly distributed. You can change the setup of the system to run on a different cloud or region and all of this while the system is online. Okay, I'm gonna spare my machine the trouble and go back to the uh, presentation. So Yugabyte Database is an Apache V2 project. We follow an open core model. We have a CE edition, which is uh, everything that I showed you today. Uh, in the demo, and we have an EE edition that uh, has the UI deployment, the, uh, like deep integration into the cloud, built-in metrics and alerting, as well as some features that are more production day two features, such as async replication to remote regions or like tiering of data when you have a lot of data to cheaper tiers. So all of those are in the EE. Uh, you can check us out on GitHub. We have a great docs. You can get started in just a few minutes if you want to give it a spin on your laptop. Um, in our, our next steps in the Yugabyte Kubernetes journey that we are like, that's on our roadmap and we're working on internally is to build a Yugabyte operator so that uh, people who are running this in production can do so with great ease and to do uh, an OSB, like open service broker integration so that end users can consume this with ease. So the first one is making it easier for the, for the operator. The second one is making it easier for the user. And uh, as far as uh, Yugabyte itself, our aim is to make Yugabyte a CNCF sandbox project because we really think we can simplify the way applications are being developed, especially on the stateful tier, like we can simplify that quite a bit. And uh, yeah, we'd love to be involved to figure out uh, how to achieve various things like cross region or like uh, local disk pass throughs or, or so on and so forth. So that's all I had. You, there's a, please feel free to reach, us, reach out to us or you can reach out to me. We'd love to hear from you. But, Kartik, excellent. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was, that was great. Uh, Thank we, you. Thanks. We can leave it open for a few minutes for questions. Anybody out there have questions for Kartik? I'll kick one off here. Uh, so how long has the, the database been available in GitHub? Got it. Great question. So uh, we've been in, in GitHub for about four months. Uh, we've been building the database for about two years, but we've been building it like without having uh, thinking about how to monetize the project or go to market. Like we didn't want to focus on that. We just wanted to focus on the core problem because it's like a fairly hard problem to solve and it takes a lot of work to get there. But more recently, like we've tried to figure out what is the company going to look like, what we want to do. It's been out on GitHub for about four months and uh, we're working on, you know, like working with a community like Kubernetes where like the philosophy of what uh, CNCF does and what we want to do or what we want to achieve is fully aligned. So we want to figure out how to make that even more accessible to developers. Got it. What, uh, you know, whatever you can share with us here would be great regarding you know, customers and, and who's actually or what types of use cases have been looking at this and, and why. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so um, uh, we've, we've um, installed uh, Yugabyte on about 10 to 15 customers um, who are trying it out. We have a couple of customers that are going into production this quarter. We're, I mean, in fact, like we're pretty much like effectively uh, with the promise of keeping backward compatibility, all of that. But uh, we're waiting for these customers to go into production and become referenceable around our 1.0 time, which is going to be the April timeframe. And uh, we expect a few more to come on board and go into production soon after. Um, we're being deployed in on-premise Google Cloud and uh, AWS. AWS, actually I should reverse the order. AWS on-premise and Google Cloud is the order of number of customers using us that we see. Uh, use cases, uh, we're closer to going into production for single row asset use cases. Um, and these are like the FinTech industry where you have uh, stock tickers and stock codes and all of that. Um, things like logistics and tracking, which is closer to a real-time IoT, like where you want to figure out where vehicles are and how do you want to do the reporting on them. There are some e-commerce sites that are looking at us. Security and fraud is another uh, place. So it's a variety of different verticals because the, the, the database itself is, is pretty horizontal. But uh, most, of the, most of these applications require like 
two or more of those three pillars, which is uh, transactionality, whether it's single row or multi-row, so data consistency is important. Distribution across the world, sync, async, uh, hybrid deployment, uh, microservices architecture, that side of things, and uh, uh, a good performance uh, for, being, for this being a serving tier. Cool. Anybody else have questions out there? Quiet group today. All right. <laughs> Kartik, thank you so much for presenting to us. I think that was that was really cool. Looking forward to uh, to working with you guys, and you know, please reach out to the storage working group if you have anything that uh, that you need. And kind of looking forward to collaborating with you in the future here. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Clint. Thank you. All right, team. So on to the the next uh, agenda item for the day. Um, we slated, I think last time we took the last half hour to, to talk a bit about our uh, KubeCon presence in EU. And uh, I think what we decided was that everybody needed some more time to, to think about it. Uh, just a, a reminder, we had three sessions that we were, that were slated for at KubeCon. First of all, the, the private session uh, is one that we're uh, you know, trying to figure out you know, who's actually going to be, what that's going to be. I think that the, the private one was going to involve possibly getting the, some members from the TOC to come speak with the SVG about, you know, what their thoughts are on the working groups and what they'd like to see and, and try to get like uh, more of a charter from them so that we could start tackling you know, some of those important things that they, they feel like uh, we should be doing. So that, that one is, is still in discussion and you know, we'll report back on, on where that goes. Uh, there were two other ones. I think uh, Saad mentioned that the intro session uh, was overlapping with the Kubernetes session for intro, and we we're working with the program committee to get that moved right now. So I think that one's still a go, and I'll let you guys know when that time gets updated so it's not conflicting. Uh, and then the second one was the, the deep dive. Uh, so the ask last time was to get people to, to think about you know, what, what kind of a agenda or what they think uh, we should be covering in these two sessions. And that's where I wanted to hand it back to the group to, to chat about. So who's got some ideas or, or comments they want to share? Mr. Steve Watt, you out there? They're always chatty. <laughs> Called out, huh? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, Dan, and I think specific for me, I mean, I was kind of, uh, I, I think the, the main thing is, um, um, it, you know, given I think there was a, Saad mentioned there was a Kubernetes meeting, yeah. um, that I thought maybe we needed just one CNCF meeting in the schedule um, for storage. Um, the, um, my comment on that was, I know um, it's easy to do a meet and greet, like theoretically, but uh, my experience having trying to do that is everyone turns up expecting to see a session. Um, and then um, it might be a good idea to do one, like a more um, outside of the session, like outside of the track, like an actual more free, open um meet and greet kind of thing. So like a total of three sessions, one, you know, you've got Saad on, I think his Kubernetes session, then we've got a, a, a CNCF, maybe just, you know, where we've been, where we're going, um, um, and, and catch folks up with more recent advancements on um, the, the, the different phases of project acceptance and, where there's, you know, CNCF projects fit in that and how to get involved with that. And then like, I think that's a more of a presentation style. And then um, we could have more of a high bandwidth, just like, you know, cheese and wine, um, maybe both interpretations of the word wine <laughs> um, yeah. in, uh, like in another forum, you know, th that's, that's just an idea. Something we might want to consider. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on that? Uh, Saad's got a, a plus one to Steve on that. Okay, cool. Um, how about, you know, just in terms of people that are going to be present? So, 
I think that, uh, you know, we've got these sessions, we can figure out exactly what they're going to be. Uh, but who's interested in, in actually being involved in more of the planning and, and possibly the delivery for these sessions? Like who's actually going to be at the conference? I'll be there and I can help out. Okay. So cool. I will be there, but I'm going to be only on th uh, Thursday. Is this Aura? Yeah. Okay, hello Aura. Okay, so we've got you for Thursday. Who else is gonna be there who wants to help, who wants to participate in it? Mm -mm -mm. Mr. Brad Childs? Want to present? No, I'm, I'm not going to be present. Okay. Ben, are you going to be there as well? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Okay. All right. Uh, well, this is Steve. Like, um, I've got, uh, we've got some vacations scheduled on like the Friday. Um, so, um, however, it's just my wife going out of town. So, um, if you guys get stuck, um, I could look into, um, you know, especially if we were focusing on Thursday and then I could travel back Friday, um, I could maybe come. Um, so just let me know. I'm not opposed to it. I was kind of wanting to go in the first place, but you know, just, I've just got to figure out the logistics. Got it. Okay. So for now, it sounds like it's, uh, Saad, possibly Steve, Orit, Ben, and myself. Um, ben, what do you think? Should we continue trying to chat about this on the SWG, or do you think we should just uh, set up some separate calls to discuss as a smaller group? Well, I, I, I think to start, does everybody feel um, a little bit like we understand the, the times and how we want to use them? Um, like we're not going to do the, the the late night one, right? That was kind of an up in the air question. Or and, and I think that I, was. I, the, I mean, what we could use that for was to get at some of the TOC members to just chat about things. But that's still up in the air whether that's going to happen. Yeah, and and whether they're going to be able to join. Yeah, and not not have dinners and who else exactly knows what's going on. Yep. Um. I mean, I, 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 I love the idea of other TSC members joining. I think you probably have Camille and Brian and some other folks that would be willing to uh, come by and just talk with SWG about um, what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I think presentations like today are great and uh, um, SWG being a place where we can have these presentations is great, uh, but I, I think it would be great if we also uh, tried to decide and use the time, the face-to-face -to, -face, to decide what else, if anything, we want the SWG to do. Um, you know, I, I think we, we left the last face-to-face -face with some ambitious goals of um, defining some, some stuff around uh, cloud native storage and what it means to operate cloud native storage. And I don't, you know, we're all busy and none of us have really been able to take that on. Um, but I think we should just like make it clear whether or not we want the SWG to have that as part of its mission or, or, or not. Um, that to me would be a, a good, a good use of the time. Sorry, Ben, uh, what specifically part of the mission? Well, we, we, it's unclear exactly what we want the SWG to be, um, you know, its output to be. Uh, and I, I think after the last face to face, one of the outcomes, at least from the way I interpret it was we were going to try to um, define, you know, in a looser sense, at least cloud native storage from a operations perspective versus from an application consumption perspective. Yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. And, and I, I mean, just, I, I don't know that we've kind of dug back into that um, or that anyone's really had the time to do that. I, I think if we would have done that, I think there would have been more clear, um, you know, a more clear mission for the SWG, which is to produce, yeah. you know, whether you want to call it white papers or definitions or whatever you want to call it uh, along those lines, but that's not really something we've done. 
um, which, which is okay. Um, and to, to me, I think that sort of leaves the group with a little bit of a less defined and less clear mission about what its output is, you know, what role it's playing. Yeah. Um, and if just to, to, to me, this face to face would be good to just settle on that. E even if the role of it is not as ambitious as to find all that other stuff, that's fine. It just would be good, I think, to have a clear understanding of um, who we want to be and who we don't want to be and what we want to do and what we don't want to do. 100% agree. I think, I think that um, that scope of the storage working group um, is in the critical path of like making any forward progress. Um, like it's, I feel like we're kind of in like it until we do that, we're sort of in like this paralysis phase. And, um, and I think, you know, just personally that it's just exactly what you described. Like um, is the CNCF storage working group, um, you can't see my air quotes, but storage like Kubernetes storage SIG, which is basically the storage that supports the application platforms, or is it all application persistence? And um, we've got to decide on what we are. Um, and uh, you know, I have an opinion on that, but I don't want to hijack this meeting to jump into that. But I do think we need to get to the bottom of that. Yeah, so, so, so Clint, to, to answer your question, question. Um, um, I would be happy with having one of the sessions just dedicated and devoted to figuring that out. Um, and I think we can either try to get feedback from TSC members ahead of time. We can have them be present to also get their, their take and perspective on it. Um, uh, or we can brainstorm ourselves and then go back and say, hey, this is what we think we're, we're doing. This is who we think we are. Um, but uh, it seems like a, so when, like a good, good use of time. Do you think that, uh, I mean, we've got the three sessions, right? The one at eight o'clock is, is questionable who we can actually get there. Or are you saying that maybe we take one of the, the general sessions and have that be like a, a round table format? Or are you saying the eight o'clock one that we try to ta tackle that? Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's going to be whichever one we're going to get critical mass at. So mm. rather than picking the time, I think whichever one we feel like we can actually get a sufficient representation of the group and have sufficient um, coverage uh, from the various perspectives and views. Is, uh, do we think that the, like a public audience is going to benefit from seeing some of that, I wouldn't call it dirty laundry. I think it's just open source process at the end of the day, figuring out what we need to do or what we're going to do. Um, but is that something that we want to be a public session? I mean, I think it's per perfectly fine if, if folks from the public want to, want to come in. I think, I mean, I don't think there needs to be any shame in us wanting to better define <laughs> exactly the, uh, uh, how we want the group to run. In fact, I think all groups should probably be doing this periodically as just a, um, continued reflection on how things are working. Yeah. And I, I think, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking about though is it's a, uh, in the catalog itself, maybe it would just need to make sure that it's well-defined, like what exactly the session is going to be so that people aren't disappointed as, as Steve has, has said before. Yeah. I, I mean, um, it, I don't, I don't know if, um, yeah. Uh, what else do we feel we have queued up to talk about, if not this? And and I I, I apologize, Steve. I my phone seems to have disconnected right when you were speaking, and then reconnected, and so I completely missed everything you said. And all I got back to was Clinton saying, "Okay, sod plus one's that." So <laughs> no idea what, what was plus one. You you got all the action items, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think I can summarize it quite quickly where I was just basically saying um, SAD as a K8 session, um, we should probably have a CNCF presentation rather than a meet and greet in the, in the track.
because despite people, this is from personal experience, despite an organizer wanting to have a meet and greet, what tends to happen is people show up expecting to see a session and they don't talk and then you just stand up there looking weird. So, um, and then the, the third one in the evening was the casual meet and greet. Um, you know, and if we can get TOC folks there, awesome. If not, like we just have a opportunity, a forum for like high bandwidth conversations, which we can always use because, um, I think like one thing it was my guess that's been, um, uh, something that TOC has observed is that it's taken a while to like diffuse exactly how the CNCF works, like, you know, different aspects of the, the, um, the governance model, et cetera. Like I know personally, like I'm being routinely educated as I ask more questions. So I think that's opportunity for more education and conversation around that is always good. You know, the, the last time we talked about the sessions, I think there were, there were two things that, that I wrote down from notes. And uh, one thing was that, you know, we could have a, a short presentation setting some context and then we'd have a panel discussion. Um, so open forum. And then the second was that we'd have a, like a review of what the SUG has been discussing as a landscape. And, you know, this obviously hasn't been ratified and is still, you know, to be determined we could at least express our, our point of view and that would be more of a presentation where we you know, put out a landscape, describe the different components and some of the projects that would fit inside that landscape. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that that sounds Clint, uh, Clint, that sounds great. Um, from a, from the perspective of if we want to have a public session where we want to bring people in and let them, interact with the uh, storage working group and ask questions and learn more about storage. I think that's all great. Um, and I think we can do that um, as perhaps one of the earlier sessions. Um, to me, the, the d discussion with the TOC and sort of the internal discussion with the storage working group itself, the burning question is really um, more about how we want to see the group function and operate going forward. And, and, and again, I mean, se sessions like today where we have great presentations um, and we can ask questions and we can educate folks, you know, I, I think it's a great opportunity to share and discover and talk about a lot of the interesting storage projects out there that can be a completely acceptable, you know, decision that we make, which is, this is sort of the extent of what we want the SWG to be. Um, but we could also do a lot more and I think it'd just be be great if we had had clarity for This group for the TOC and for everybody else about any of the other stuff that we're trying to do it Seems like it's a good opportunity to have these discussions um, face to face versus just via um, The uh, online yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, But we could also do it in one of our future just calls yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll put it back on everybody else, which is if everyone agrees that we want to have those discussions, when do we want to have them? Do we want to have them in the face-to-face -face? and do we want to leave the, um, the uh, sorry, do, do, do we want to have them on the calls and do we want to leave the face-to-face -face as more of a, hey, let's educate people out there about what's happening in the storage land. Let's talk about some of the projects that are presented. Um, let's talk about any of that kind of stuff, let's give perspectives, or do we want to use it as a, as a working session for the, the storage working group itself? Can I say both? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that at the conference, the public sessions, people are gonna expect, I mean, you're gonna have complete newbies to the area who are just really interested in storage. And I think they're probably gonna expect more canned and well presented information so that they can you know, quickly catch up. Um, I think that, you know, we've got our needs as a group, which are somewhat less, like slightly separate. Um, but I, I feel like we could accomplish both at the, at the event. I, I think that, you know, we could take one session, we could make sure we just had a you know, great intro presentation landscape, you know, open panel discussion. So at least we, and we have a mix of you know intro and, and more advanced discussion going on there, uh, and then we have um, 
maybe that, that extra session we use as that face-to-face, -face, which is that round table with you know, TSC members to, to discuss what the SWG can be. Works for me. I feel excited that other folks think. Sounds good. So is that, is that what, what we want to do? Um, anybody have any objections, any other ideas? Sounds like um, then we sh we'll want to maybe prepare some of that canned content, Clint, yep. um, which you, know, you and I can kick off and then we can uh, recruit others. Okay. Excellent. Should we call it a meeting for the day then? Yep. All right. Uh, we are, we have next week we have, uh, I believe it's dot mesh presenting Not next week, but the next session is dot mesh doing our first 30 minutes. Um, if anybody has any other storage projects, please do reach out. Right, we're, we definitely want to get that agenda filled. I, I definitely enjoy hearing from all the, the different interesting storage projects like Ben was talking about out there in the ecosystem. I think it helps educate me on what's going on. And so I enjoy it. Um, so if you guys have any, anything else you, you presented here, please do let me know so we can get them on the agenda. Yeah, just a, a plus one on the dot mesh for those of you that don't know that's um, Luke and crowd that were the creators of Flocker. So uh, pretty relevant to the space and pretty smart. The original gangsters of container store. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for your time and uh, meet you back 10 minutes in the day. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.